2 Corinthians 10 tonight. Uh, the first person I ever heard say this was Tony Evans. He may not have invented this saying, but I, I heard it on uh, KHCB. Is that the one, 105? Yeah. Uh, I heard, it, heard him say this some years ago, and I liked it. He said, Christians are a lot like tea bags. You don't really know what they're made of until you put them in hot water. And I thought that was a good saying. And, and what he meant by that wasn't just trouble, but specifically when we're attacked, when we are uh, accused falsely, or when we're uh, insulted in some way, when we have reason to feel wronged, that's when our true character shows up. Today, as it happens, I, uh, I was on the road, I won't tell you which road, but I, I, the guy driving right, right beside me and gave me the middle finger. And uh, I wasn't mad, first of all, because I kind of deserved it. I had, I had started to turn left and then realized, oh, this isn't where I want to turn left, and then gotten back in my lane, and I didn't realize he was there. So he had to break for me. So it was my fault. And secondly, because I just thought, you know, why get mad? What, what difference does it make, really? Um, and I remember being like him. I don't know that I ever went around shooting the middle finger at people on the roads, but I did get angry a lot, especially back when I was younger and, and used to commute in Houston traffic every day. You get angry. You, uh, you yell, you bang your, hand, your fist against the dashboard, and you realize, what am I accomplishing here? Bruising my knuckles, making myself look like a fool, over what? So stress insults, inconveniences, all these things bring out our true character. It is easy, if you want to bad enough, it is easy to exhibit Christ-like character when everything's going fine. Sunday mornings to walk around and to say all the right things and to have a pleasant look on your face and to treat people with kindness and consideration, I think just about all of us are capable of that. But what happens when someone says something about you that either isn't true or maybe is true and you didn't want it out there or somebody, uh, somebody blames you for something that wasn't your fault or somebody just gets it in their mind to make your life miserable. And I think we've all been there. How do we respond to that? I don't see Paul as the perfect man. We see him at various times in his humanity and he's a sinner just like us. He even admits it. But there are a lot of things about Paul that I admire, and one of them is that he handles accusations well. Now, just as a, a deeper dive into this, there are scholars who believe, I'm not one of them, not that I'm calling myself a Bible scholar, but I don't agree with this school of thought, but they believe that 2 Corinthians is actually two separate letters. Chapters 1 through 9 is one letter he sent to them, and chapters 10 through 13 is a completely separate letter. The reason they think that is chapters 10 through 13 is such a drastically different tone. You know, last week we saw him talking to them about, I'm going to come take this collection, or I'm sending these men to take up this collection, and I know you're going to do the right thing. I've been bragging on you. You're going to want to, you're going to, want to validate the things I've said about you, so I trust that you're going to be generous. He's very kind and gentle in everything he says. All of a sudden, from chapter 10 on, he takes a very combative tone, sarcastic in a sense. And yet, and yet, and by the way, and that, that's, that's why these scholars say, oh, this must be just two separate letters that some scribe just stuck together. I don't think that's true. I think we're, he's perfectly capable of writing a letter that has a transition, and this is it. And, and yet, in the midst of his uh, combativeness, when he's answering accusations. I want you to notice how he does so. He doesn't do it by going on the attack against them. That's our way of doing things. Oh yeah, you said that about me? Well, let me listen to what I have to say about you. You think I've messed up? Let me tell everybody all the things I've seen you do. Look how Paul responds in contrast. He says, I, first, verse 1 of chapter 10, I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. So right there, you see him revealing one of the charges against him. When he says, I who am humble when face to face 
but bold when I'm away. Some translations say it differently. It says, I'm timid when I'm face to face, but bold when away. He's not admitting that's true of him. He's saying, that's what you're saying about me. There are some in the Corinthian church who say, we don't need to worry about Paul. He's no big deal. He writes these great letters, but when you meet him in face, in person, he's weak need and a pushover. Paul says, I know you're saying this about me, but the truth is, if I seem that way, it's because I am trying to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, which is gentleness. He says at the beginning, I entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Now, let's just be honest about something. Although we know that Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Although we know that gentleness is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, according to Galatians 5. Most of us, just including just about all of us men, don't really desire to be more meek or more gentle because we're afraid that if we are, the world will take advantage of us. We want to see ourselves as tough. We want to see ourselves as uh, strong and dynamic and in charge. Nobody ever got on the cover of Forbes or Time or uh, Sports Illustrated or Rolling Stone or any of these magazines. Nobody ever became rich and famous. Nobody ever got elected to public office by being meek and gentle. Those are, those are traits the world claims to admire but secretly despises. And yet Paul here says, it's my desire to be as gentle as possible. I, I want to refer to you something that he says back in 1 Corinthians 4. When again, he's dealing with the Corinthian church over an issue where they need to change. And he says something interesting in 1 Corinthians 4.21. He says, what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? He's essentially saying, get your act together so that I don't have to come there and say ugly things to you. So I don't have to come there and knock some heads. There is a time for that. But Paul does not want to do that. He wants to be as gentle as possible. He wants to be as humble, as kind as possible. He wants, he wants to win them over with love, not destroy them. That's very instructive. Because when we, when we hear a rumor that someone's saying accusatory things, defamatory things, derogatory things about us, the last thing in the world we want to respond with is meekness and gentleness. We want to blast them with both barrels, right? So, verse 3, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. So right here what he's doing is, he's telling them his motive. Why do I respond this way? You probably expected me to come at you with everything I've got, to accuse you of all sorts of things, maybe even to write you off and, or, or never even want to see you again. But I'm just telling you, I've learned that the way a follower of Jesus responds when there's accusation, when there's, uh, when there's insult, cannot be the way of the world. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, this is a key passage for us as Christians who live in a culture that is becoming increasingly less Christian. And you, you have to have recognized that, right? I mean, all of you are my age or older. I can remember when uh, our culture was much more friendly towards Christianity. And all of you can as well. Uh, you know, I've, I've told this story before, but uh, Peter Drucker, the businessman, used to tell the story of when he first moved to New York and he wanted to buy his first house, he went into this, uh, see this loan officer to, to get a loan on a, on a mortgage and the loan officer said, well, sir, where, where do you go to church? And Drucker said, well, why does that matter? And the loan officer said, well, if you don't go to church or at least a synagogue, we're not sure we want to give you a loan. Now, can you imagine that conversation today? That would never happen right? Number one, they would never think it was any of their business. Number two, they wouldn't see it as a, as a sign of a good character or good faith. Uh, so that's, that's how our culture has changed. It's gone from being a Christian gives you a leg up in most sectors of society, the way it was 50 years ago, 
to today where we're not anywhere close to being persecuted, but our advantages, our privileges, our home court advantage, you might say, is pretty much gone. And we can count on, especially if you're in certain areas, if you're in, if you're in the academic world, if, you are, uh, if you're around people who are serious about making money, if there, there are certain segments of society where you're going to be openly scorned for your beliefs where it's, you've got a target on your back. You are going to be ridiculed and maybe even passed over for certain things if you show yourself to be a true Christian. So in a world like that, we have to know, how do I respond when I feel taken advantage of, when I feel pushed around, when I feel accused, when I feel disrespected? And Paul's point is, in times of conflict, we cannot let ourselves respond the way non-Christians do. That's That's... Job number one is, is you can't fight fire with fire. As a Christian, you cannot respond with what they're giving you. Otherwise, you're denying the faith. Otherwise, you're telling them that your beliefs are just words. They don't really change the way you live, the way you act. Um, our thought, in fact, this is going to really bother some of you. In those situations, our thought should not be winning in the fleshly sense. Again, I, I can remember uh, being young and, and dumb and, and some kid goes chest to chest with you in high school. Your, your reputation's in, in, you know, in, at stake, and so you have to look tough, even though I was, well, no bigger than I am now. So, uh, but you can't admit that. You have to, you have to act like you're going you're gonna to defend yourself. You're going to punch them in the eye, and it's about winning. It's about not backing down. But as a Christian... <laughs> That can't be your top priority. It can't be about you're looking tough or you're looking smart or you're looking better than that other person. It has to be something else. Instead, we should have God's goals in mind and use God's weapons. Now, that's interesting. He says we don't use the weapons of this world, but we have weapons of divine power to destroy strongholds. What are the weapons of God? Well, I think you take this passage and you look at what Paul wrote in Ephesians 6 about the full armor of God. And without reading that whole passage to you, I think we're all familiar with it, you can sum it up with this. The weapons of God are prayer. They're the truth, telling the truth in love. Sometimes, by the way, the whole truth means admitting some things that aren't in your favor. Sometimes telling the whole truth means saying, you know, you have a point, and I will concede to you like just a minute ago. Yeah, it was my fault. I pulled in front of that guy. That's easy to say when he's not in front of me. But, but could I say that if this was a nose-to-nose situation in a, you know, in a deacon's meeting or a committee meeting or just out there in the, in the church hall or out in my neighborhood? Could I just say, listen, I just want to say, first of all, I'm sorry. I did this. That's part of speaking the truth in love. But part of it also is saying, uh, other things that may not be what that person wants to hear. Sometimes speaking the truth in love means hurting that person's feelings even more. But you can't hold back because the truth must be spoken in love. So prayer, the truth is a weapon, the sword of truth, the, the word of God. Faith is a weapon. Faith meaning I just trust that even if in this one situation it looks like I'm getting my clock cleaned, that God's going to work it out to His glory. I may look bad. I may get my feelings hurt. I may be embarrassed, but because I'm choosing to do what God has told me to do instead of what my flesh wants to do, I'm trusting, I have faith that God's going to use that to His glory. Then another weapon, godly character that is unimpeachable. The belt of righteousness, right? The, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This idea that when we are put into hot water and the world sees what we're really made of, they will have no reason to accuse us. One of the most inspiring stories in the Bible for me is the story of Daniel as an old man being elevated to the rank of one of the top three advisors to King Darius in the kingdom of Persia. And everybody who ranked under him was so jealous that this Jew had taken such a lofty position in the great Persian Empire that they tried in vain to find something to accuse him of. 
And in the end, they said, you know, we've got really nothing we can accuse him of unless we use his faith against him and create some law that makes it illegal for him to practice his faith because we know he won't stop praying to his God. And that's such an inspiring story, and that should be something that all of us should be able to say is, go ahead, search my life. Watch me, you know, shadow me, and see what you can find because I'm going to live a life of integrity. And then that is a weapon. That is a weapon that the Lord can use to thwart the schemes of the enemy. When, you're not, when you don't have anything to hide, uh, that is a tremendously freeing way to live. Then he says, take every thought captive. I know you've heard that phrase, but you may not have known what it means. It does mean we're responsible for our thought life, but can we all just be honest and say, that's really hard to do. Now, I heard a preacher do this once, and then I stole it, and it didn't work for me. So I'm going to try it on y'all, okay? So here's what the preacher did. He said, I'm I'm going to give you five seconds where I want you to think about anything other than red monkeys. Okay, five seconds. I'm going to count to five, and in that five seconds, I want you to think about anything other than red monkeys. All right, you ready? One, two, three. And then, you know, afterwards you say, okay, what did you think of? Red monkeys. Yeah, it's the power of suggestion. And it's not just that. It's the more you try not to think of something, the more you're going to think of it. Better illustration is, if you're ever... You can't get to sleep at night because you know something's coming up in the morning. Maybe you've got a big doctor's appointment or a big interview or even something as simple as, I just know I have to get up early to make it to the airport. And you can't sleep because you keep thinking about that over and over again. Why does your mind work that way? Why can't you just flip a little switch that says, I'm just not going to think about it? And yet it doesn't. So when we say take every thought captive, I want us all to agree that that's not just something we can do by our own effort. But the problem is, most of us, as Christians, don't even try. We're commanded to take every thought captive, and yet we surrender our minds to the enemy without a fight. We focus on all the outward stuff, because that's the stuff other people see. Because that matters to us. We we want people to think we're godly. So we get good at... Okay, I'm not going to say those dirty words. I'm not going to do those bad things in full view of others, but we don't deal with what's going on inside of us. And so we nurture that pride, that lust, that anger, that bitterness, or whatever the case may be. So how do we, how do we win? How do we take every thought captive? There are two instructions I want you to know from Scripture, and you've heard these before. But one is Romans 12.1. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind means that Part of the Holy Spirit's job is to change the way you think. But notice it's a passive verb. It doesn't say transform your mind. It says be transformed. So it means that's something we let the Holy Spirit do to us. We we bring to Him our thoughts. We bring to Him uh, those inner parts of ourselves that we know aren't right, aren't the way God wants us to be. And we say, Holy Spirit, change me. And and i got to tell you, that's a long process. There are parts of my inner life that I pray about just about every day, and I'm not going to share them all with you. You wouldn't want me to be your pastor anymore, but um, (laughs) all of us are that way. We've got things we should be letting the Holy Spirit work on. It doesn't happen overnight. You keep coming back to Him and saying, God, I'm having a really hard time forgiving this person. Please help me. Or Lord, I, I keep indulging in these thoughts, these fantasies, and I know they're wrong, so help me to deal with that. And you pray about it, and you pray about it, and God may even give you certain uh, outside help that, that gets you through some of these things. But that's number one, is be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Secondly, is Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And that's a beautifully written verse, but let me just sum it up this way. Occupy your mind with what is good. So instead of trying to not think about red monkeys, you you instead think about the right things. The key is not to try to stop thinking about something. And this is why I said the the first time I used that illustration, it failed. Because a couple of weeks later, I I was talking to a, a woman in my church, 
And she just kind of casually said, you know, it's sort of like you said in that sermon the other day with the red monkeys, there's really nothing you can do about your thoughts. I said, no, that's not the point I was trying to make. <laughs> that's the opposite of what I was trying to say. I was saying we can't do it on our own effort. So that's that first point, let the Holy Spirit change you. But the second point is instead of just trying your best to cut off bad thoughts, occupy your mind with what is good. So to go back to the illustration of you can't sleep at night. What's the only thing that works for me sometimes is either to start praying or to get up and read. Occupy your mind with something good. And back, actually that's scientifically backed up. If you just lay in bed and toss and turn, you're, you're, you're defeating yourself. You've got to change the environment. Go and sit down and read until you can't keep your eyes open anymore. And I've always thought if uh, either I'm going to get to sleep or... I'm going to enjoy reading scripture or praying. Either way, the devil loses. So I think it's a good technique. Occupy your mind with something good. So verse 6. Being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Now here Paul says, there is church discipline coming. For those of you who continue to be rebellious, who continue to mock God and assault His apostles, there will be discipline but I'm waiting until enough of you are with me, I think is what he's saying. When your obedience is complete, I will punish the disobedience. When, enough, when I feel like enough of you are with me, I'm going to come and we'll root out those who continue to be seeds of trouble. Verse 7, he says, Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. Now, that's a little bit hard to understand. The NIV says it this way when it says, look at what is before your eyes. NIV says, you are judging by appearances. I think that's a pretty good, it just makes sense with the context. What Paul, I think, is saying is, you're, you're focused on superficial things instead of looking at who's really serving the Lord. And whether that's what Paul means here or not, I really think it is, it's a good time for me to make this point. The most gifted, the most dynamic, the most magnetic people aren't necessarily the most spiritually mature. And one, of the, one of the problems we have in Christianity these days is we just elevate giftedness. We call it anointing. We make it sound, seem like, oh, well, God loves those people more than others. Um, now, now y'all know you should know by now how much I value trying my best to preach well. But a person who gives a gripping sermon doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily the best, most mature, most committed person in the room. That's just a person who's using their gifts. Uh, the person who gets up and sings a beautiful song. Same thing goes. In fact, those two people, I hate to say this, but it's true, those two people can both be far from God. They can be in active rebellion against Him and still be using their gifts in a very effective way. God spoke through Balaam's donkey, remember? Yeah. And yet we elevate giftedness so much. As we're about to see, Paul knew he wasn't really the most dynamic speaker. And so he's saying, you're judging things by superficial means. Last time I came, you weren't impressed with me in person. Okay, be that as it may but I'm still an apostle. So exercise some discernment. Verse 8, For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up, and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech of no account. Again, He's quoting their accusations against him. He knows what they're saying about him. Not the whole Corinthian church, but enough of the people, his enemies. He says, let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. And you hear the threat there, right? I was gentle when I came before. I'd prefer to be gentle when I come back the next time. But they need to understand that I mean every word I say. And when I have to, I will bring the authority of an apostle against you and do what needs to be done because God's church 
matters. Um, and, and isn't it interesting that Paul's aware that he's not a dynamic speaker? Let me just show you a few examples of what I'm talking about. All of these are from the Corinthian letters. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 17. I should have just written all these out so I wouldn't have to look them up. But 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17 says... For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, let the cross, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. I know that I'm not an eloquent person, Paul says. And that's good, because that way you know it was the cross that is the power, not me. Chapter 2 of that same letter, 1 Corinthians, verse 1. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come to you proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and with much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He's acknowledging, when I came to you the first time and preached I know I didn't light it on fire preaching-wise. It was not my eloquence. It wasn't my wisdom. It wasn't, uh, in fact, I was, I was weak. I was fearful. I was trembling. But the Holy Spirit was present, and that's what did the work. Um, 2 Corinthians 11, we're going to get to that next week, but I'm going to go ahead and read verse 6 of chapter 11. Um, Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. So I believe that Paul wasn't being falsely modest. I believe Paul understood he wasn't the most thrilling of speakers. He probably wasn't the best looking guy either. Right? I mean, a man who'd been through as much physical uh, torment as he had probably had hit more than his share of scars. I, I would suspect that he probably walked with a significant limp. Um, probably wasn't a man of uh, great musculature, you know, he didn't eat a lot. He probably just wasn't an impressive person in person. And, and he admits that. And yet, he says, don't test me, because I'm not afraid to be assertive. I'm not afraid to bring the full authority of the gospel against you, the power of God that has been given to me as an apostle. So let me just divert back to the point I made earlier. While we exalt giftedness, and I think every person should use the gifts God gave them to the best of their abilities. Don't be afraid to hold gifted people accountable. One of the mistakes that churches make is when they have a gifted preacher or singer or leader and they see behavior in that person that they know is wrong, but they say, yeah, but who am I? He's the great man. No, go talk to him and say, I don't like what you're doing. This is wrong. He needs to be confronted. On the other hand, when you have someone, maybe a life group teacher or a pastor or somebody else who you are serving alongside, and they're not tremendously gifted. They're obviously doing what God called them to do, but they're not the most interesting. They're not the most thrilling. Understand that God can use them in even greater ways than that person who's the superstar. I, you know, I, I remember when I was at a seminary, and Henry Blackaby came to speak. And I had read Experiencing God, and I was so excited to hear him speak. And uh, there were several guys in my class said, I don't know that I'm going to go to chapel. I've heard him. He's not very good. And I thought, yeah, but he wrote Experiencing God. I mean, I want to hear what he has to say. And I went to chapel that day. Chapel was optional. You could skip if you wanted. A lot of guys did. And it was not the most thrilling sermon, but man, the Lord spoke. If you weren't there to to meet God, if you were just there to judge a a sermon on a sermon's merits, you would have said, eh, that's a C minus at best. But it was so obvious the Holy Spirit was present. It was so obvious that He meant the things He'd said, that He'd thought these things through. He'd studied them in the Word. He'd lived them out. Let's not worship what is thrilling, what is gripping, what what draws big crowds. When that happens, praise the Lord. But sometimes it's that, it's that humble servant that nobody is impressed by who does the greatest things, eternally speaking. And let's remember that as, as God's people. All right, verse 12. 
Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. He's, he's critiquing his critics by saying they find ways to make themselves look good. They're all about their reputation. Of course, they're going to look better than I am. Verse 13, but we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we are the first we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. What is Paul talking about? You may remember in Galatians 2, 1 through 10, he talks about how early in his ministry, when they were still, the early church was still figuring out, okay, who's eligible to receive the gospel? And they finally conceded, you know, Paul and Barnabas are, are absolutely right to take the gospel beyond, Jew, uh, beyond Jews beyond Israelites in foreign lands. They should go to these Gentiles. And they said, tell you what, Paul, you and Barnabas, you knock yourselves out, evangelize every Gentile you want. We're going to focus on the Jews. And so Paul's saying, we're just sticking to our territory. We're just doing what the church told us to do. So then in verse 15, he says, we do not boast beyond limit in the labor of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Now, I may be wrong, but I think this is a kind of a subtle swipe at his critics by saying, my ministry and my team's ministry is we take the gospel where it's never been heard. That's what we do. We don't go someplace where somebody else is working and steal their members and, and build on their foundation. That's what those guys are doing. They're trying to steal you from me so they can call you their own. They're trying to build on my foundation. Not that Paul was worried about reputation. He just he wanted them to understand, take a look at motive here. My motive has always been to take the gospel where it's never been heard. These guys just want a crowd. So keep in mind that motive. As, I mean, he says it in, in Romans 15, 20. I, I've made it my decision never to build on someone else's foundation. Verse 17. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. What does it mean to boast in the Lord? Isn't that an interesting phrase? Because all of us would agree we don't want to be accused of boasting, and yet Paul says it's good to boast in the Lord. Well, what does that even mean? I think there are two tests. When you are saying things, uh, let's say you're, you're talking about something great your life group did or that you did. Maybe we're talking about a transforming relationship and you want everybody to know this, this guy I've been witnessing to came to know Christ or this this family I've been praying for and reaching out to, they came to church this Sunday. Or this couple that I've been praying for and mentoring, they decided not to get a divorce. Those are all great things. And there's a school of thought that says, keep that to yourself. You don't want to sound like you're bragging. And yet there's the other, other side of the coin that says, yeah, but you need to celebrate what God has done, right? So how do you know when you're bragging on yourself or when you're praising God for what He's done? I think there are a couple of important tests. One is... The test of your own motive. Are you trying to make yourself look good or trying to bring glory to God? And, and you know you're really bringing glory to God if no one gives you any credit and it doesn't bother you. And that's a, that's a hard test, isn't it? Because we want credit. We want glory. So that, that first test is the test of motive. Uh, I, I know that that's a big one for me. Um, when I get up and preach on Sunday mornings, I always have to pray and say, Lord, am I, am I doing this? Am I working so hard at this because I want to impress people or because I care about people and I care about your word? And, and I think every one of us in whatever we do for the Lord need to keep that in mind. What is my motive? The second test is the test of result. So when you give your good report about what God has done, do people come up and praise you or do they praise the Lord as a result? That's a, that's a key test too. And again, that doesn't mean that it's wrong to accept compliments. 
Sometimes people are being encouraging and you should receive that and thank them and, and just cherish whatever encouragement you can get. But your hope and your prayer should be they walk away praising God. Look at what God has done. All right? So let me just close with this story. I've used this before, but I love it. So uh, back in the Middle Ages, a farmer grew an enormous carrot. Biggest carrot he'd ever seen in his life. This is Texas, so we can call it a, an okra. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't matter. But So let's say a carrot. He takes this carrot to the palace. He wants the king to see his carrot. And after waiting and waiting behind all the people who are there to see the king, he's finally ushered into the court of the king. And he says, oh, king, look at this carrot. I grew it in my garden. It's the biggest thing I've ever seen. I want to give it to you because you're such a great king. And I just want to give this as a, as a thanksgiving to, to show you our love for you. And the king is wise enough to see this guy is just a simple man. He doesn't want anything in return. He's just genuinely trying to praise and bless his king. And so the king says, well, that's such an amazing carrot. Tell you what, I've got a piece of land right next to the palace. I've been looking for somebody to farm that land for me. Why don't you and your family move onto that piece of land and you can be my farmer? The farmer's overjoyed. He had no idea that was coming. Well, there's a nobleman in the court and he sees this happen and he thinks, well, that's what you get for a carrot. So the next day, he brings into the court of the king this massive, beautiful white stallion. He says, oh, king, this is the finest horse in all of my stables, and I am giving him to you. You can do whatever you want with him. You can race him. You can sire him out, whatever you want to do. But this, this horse is yours. And the king says, well, thank you very much. And that's all he says. And the nobleman says, now, wait a second, king. Yesterday, that farmer brought that carrot and you gave him a choice piece of land. I bring you something worth way more and you don't give me anything in return. Why is that fair? And the king says, well, that farmer gave me his carrot. You tried to give yourself that horse. And that's the question we've always got to ask in our service of the Lord is, are we serving the Lord or are we trying to gift ourselves? Always, always that tension. Which are you more like, the farmer or the nobleman? Let's pray. Lord, this chapter we started by talking about what we do, how we respond when we're attacked. I pray, Lord, that uh, anybody here who's in a moment of stress, a moment of uh, feeling like they're under pressure or under attack, Lord, give them strength. Help them to respond in the way they should. Help us, O oh Lord, to disciple the people of this church in such a way that we would live that way, uh, the difficult path of serving you. Lord, at the end of the, of the message, we, we talked about our motives being pure. And that's the hardest part for all of us. So help us to be honest with ourselves. I pray, O oh Holy Spirit, that you would change our hearts day by day to make us more like the heart of Jesus. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray all these things. Amen. Thank you.